Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mendy Minjares, and I'm the executive director of the Seattle Children's Autism Center and also the co-host of Grand Rounds, along with Carol Rockhill, who is here today um, joining us. And we're really excited to welcome Brenna Maddox, who I will turn it over to Karen Bears to introduce in a minute. We have our sort of our little um, succession here of introducers. We usually like to start off with uh, an acknowledgement of both the land that we're on and also any other um, important acknowledgements. And of course, this is Black Lives Matter Month. We had three very nice slides made by our Grand Rounds Operations Support. Um, so yeah, we have three slides here. One is um, a picture from Black Lives Matter March, it looks like in 2020 um, here in Seattle. So that is a very nice way to remember and acknowledge that uh, here in Seattle, there's lots of support, of course, for Black Lives Matter and Black History Month. Opportunities for us to read, watch, listen, and learn. There we go. That's what I was looking for. And then, of course, reminding us that it's Black History Month. So we want to um, make sure that we fully acknowledge that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Karen to introduce our speaker. Uh, so I'm really excited today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brenna Maddox. Uh, Brenna is a clinical psychologist by training who received her PhD at Virginia Tech under the mentorship of Susan White. She went on to complete her clinical internship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Autism Research at CHOP under the mentorship of Bob Schultz, and subsequently the Penn Center for Mental Health at the University of Pennsylvania under the mentorship of David Mandel. I bring this all up to say that in the autism world, uh, that Dr. Maddox has engaged in what we might call the Cadillac version of autism and implementation science training, which you'll hear, sh you'll hear shortly she's put to very good use. Dr. Maddox now serves as an assistant professor in the UNC Chapel Hill Department of Psychiatry Teach Autism Program. As an implementation scientist at TEACH, her work has focused on improving community services for people on the autism spectrum across the lifespan. How this is translated into practice is an absolutely stellar portfolio of innovative research programming in autism, with funding support through NIMH, the Foundation of Hope, the FAR Fund, and PCORI. This research has been focused on some of our most vulnerable, underserved, and under-researched autistic populations, including research on enhancing the training of community mental health clinicians, working with autistic youth, youth with anxiety, comparing CBT and mindfulness with autistic adults, and examining suicide prevention in this population. Noting uh, one of our PCORI grants is focused on comparing the effectiveness of two brief suicide prevention interventions for autistic youth in four health systems across the U.S. In all our spare time, uh, Dr. Maddox serves on the Expert Hub team for Echo Autism Mental Health. In addition, she's a deputy editor for the journal Autism and Adulthood and a co-chair of the American Association of Suicidolo Suicidology's Autism and Suicide Committee. As impressive as this work is, I can say that Brenna is an equally amazing colleague. Uh, our professional paths have crossed over the years, and I specifically had the pleasure of working with her when we served as co-chairs of the Autism and Developmental Disabilities SIG at ABCT. Uh, and I'll say while well, shining brilliantly as our leader of the SIG uh, to help you get to know Brenna a little better, uh, and frankly to speak about her ability to, to inspire others, one of my favorite contributions of hers during this time was the run that she organized at the ABCT conference in Atlanta. I bring this up because it's impressive to get a gaggle of jet lag psychologists up at the crack of dawn at a conference to run in a, was it a 5K, Britta? It was not a short distance, and it was early in the morning. Uh, so, yes, that speaks to her, again, the ability to inspire. Um, I imagine she will be just as inspiring in her presentation today, which is focused on suicide prevention and intervention for individuals on the autism spectrum. So with that, welcome, Brenna. So good to see you. Uh, and we're all looking forward to learning from you this morning. Thank you so much, Karen. That was the best introduction I think I've ever had. Definitely nice to remember that that very fun uh, run. I would call it a fun run. I don't know if everyone would, would agree from that ABCT in Atlanta. We were just saying that uh, that same conference is in Seattle in 2023. So hopefully I will be in person uh, in Seattle later this year. I wish I could be there in person with you all today, but thank you everyone for your flexibility. For about the next hour or so, I'll be talking about suicide prevention and intervention for individuals on the autism spectrum. And it's really an honor to be able to present to you all um, virtually there in Seattle. So thank you so much for the opportunity 
to talk today. So to give you a brief overview of what I'm planning to cover today, I'm going to talk a little bit about why am I focused on this topic of autism and suicide risk? What are some available crisis supports and resources? Barriers to accessing mental health services that people on the spectrum are facing every day with some suggested possible solutions. And then as Karen just mentioned, we just wrapped up year one of five years of a PCORI funded suicide prevention trial that I'd like to share some more details with you all about. And then again, save some time for questions and discussion. Just a quick note about the language I'll be using in today's presentation. I don't know about you all, but when I was a, a graduate student with Susan White, as Karen mentioned, I was always trained and told to use person first language or person with autism, child with autism, adult with autism. It wasn't until more recently that I've been learning from many autistic individuals, including my own autistic collaborators on our research team about their preference for identity first language or autistic person, autistic individual. And of course, there's no universal preference for language, but because my collaborators on the spectrum prefer identity first language, you'll hear me use identity first language in today's presentation. Um, if you're interested in learning more about some of the history of these language considerations in the autism field, I always like to recommend this paper from the journal Autism and Adulthood, it came out a couple of years ago, and it says suggestions for autism researchers, but I would argue that it really is uh, is a great fit for a wider audience as well. All right, and feel free to put any questions as I'm going in the in the chat. I know Carol's going to be monitoring that, um, and I am happy to answer any and all questions from you all. Okay, so first, a, a question posed here. What do we know about suicide and autism? I would say at large, this is a topic that's been uh, mostly under-researched. However, it's a quickly growing area of research. So when I was in grad school, I don't remember learning anything specifically about suicide and autism, um, but since graduating, the number of publications and presentations on this topic has really skyrocketed. Um, the majority of published studies at this point have focused on prevalence, estimates, and risk factors. So I just wanna briefly cover that literature now, along with some emerging work on the warning signs of suicide in autistic individuals. So what we know about the prevalence of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in autistic individuals is, is very concerning. There's now convincing evidence that suicide is a leading cause of premature death in the autistic community. And the prevalence of suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors are significantly elevated in autistic children, adolescents, and adults compared to the general population. When I um, talk with you know, clinicians, uh, professionals about this, I always like to make it clear that even if you're working with that younger age group, this is still something to have on your radar. And we know that suicidal ideation and behavior have been reported in autistic kids under 10 years of age. So clearly this is a problem that we need to learn a lot more about. I think a natural next question when we know this elevated uh, rate, the elevated rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviors is why. Why are autistic individuals experiencing this at heightened rates? So I'm gonna share a brief list of risk factors of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I wanna make clear that this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the most studied and supported risk factors, as well as some that may be more specific to autism. The first one here, I'm, like, I'm sure is not a surprise uh, to anyone listening. Having a co-occurring psychiatric condition is a risk factor for suicidal thoughts and behaviors in autistic people. There have been some large uh, national studies that came out recently highlighting this as a major risk factor. One in particular from Denmark looked at um, throughout the whole nation, a sample of autistic adults who had either attempted or died by suicide. And from that group, more than 90% had a co-occurring psychiatric condition. So that definitely caught my, my eye, more than 90%. Um, and the most common psychiatric conditions in that study were depression and anxiety. Again, probably not surprising to anyone listening. Lack of social support has also been found to be a risk factor, as well as more, more broadly, unmet support needs. 
Um, so in the studies that I've looked at unmet support needs, they've really defined this in, in a broad way. So unmet support needs could mean um, unmet needs with employment, with, with health care, uh, with um, education. So I think it'll be really interesting moving forward to get a little bit more specific about uh, which unmet support needs um, are a major risk factor for suicidal thoughts and behavior. Something called camouflaging or masking, which I'm guessing uh, most people here know quite a bit about. This is a, a newer identified risk marker for suicidality in autistic people. It basically describes when autistic individuals attempt to mask or hide their autistic traits in order to try and fit into social situations. And we're learning more and more, both from quantitative and qualitative research, that camouflaging can negatively affect the mental health of autistic individuals. Receiving a late diagnosis of autism, so later in life, getting that first time autism diagnosis has also been shown um, to be a risk factor. I think that this is likely related to this unmet support needs, right? So if you're not receiving a diagnosis of autism until, until later in life, you've gone throughout your childhood and your adolescence without getting the autism tailored or autism specific supports. Autistic females are at a particularly high risk of suicidal thoughts and behavior, so we're learning more about that. And then the final one up here is something called autistic burnout. And this may be a new term for some people listening today. This is really conceptualized as resulting from uh, chronic life stress and a mismatch of expectations and abilities without those adequate supports. So basically burnout from living in a society that was largely defined um, by neurotypical individuals and having that, that burnout as a result. And if you're interested in learning more about autistic burnout, I'll highlight one other paper from the journal Autism and Adulthood. This paper really defined and described autistic burnout and also explained some of the links to poor mental health and increased suicidal thoughts and behaviors. All right, so um, as you all know, risk factors are those characteristics or conditions that make it more likely that individuals will think about or attempt suicide. And now I wanna talk briefly about warning signs, which indicate a more immediate risk of suicide. Unfortunately, we have much less research in the autism field on warning signs of suicide compared to risk factors. One thing that we are learning more and more about, particularly from autistic individuals with lived experience of suicidality, is that autistic distress or autistic crisis may not look the same as neurotypical distress or neurotypical crisis. And, and I'll talk some more about that in a moment. Kind of main takeaway here is that for some autistic individuals, of course, not everyone, but for some, when they are at kind of peak distress, they actually may appear quite calm on the outside. And this is difficult, right, for us as clinicians to really be able to distinguish what's going on. And I've learned from my autistic partners with lived experience of suicidality, how important it is to really listen to what the individual is saying. So listening very literally to their words, um, even if they don't look or, you know, appear distressed on, on the outside. So I know that sounds a lot more simple and straightforward than it actually is in clinical practice, but do want to highlight that we're learning more and more about this in the field. All right, so I'm going to be talking quite a bit today about one of my very close collaborators, Lisa Morgan, pictured here. Lisa is an autistic adult who advocates for suicide prevention for the autistic community, and she brings her lived experience of suicide loss and suicidality. And she and I work together on multiple projects, some of which you'll hear about today. Um, and as Karen mentioned, we um, have an autism and suicide committee that's part of the American Association of Suicidology. And Lisa is the founder of that committee, and she and I are the current co-chairs. So Lisa had this great idea a couple of years back um, related to the warning signs of suicide for the general public. So you can find this list of, of general warning signs very easily, right? If you just Google warning signs of suicide, there's a pretty standard list that's on most websites. Um, and Lisa, from her lived experience, felt like that list is really missing the mark in a lot of ways 
for autistic people and that there need to be some other considerations that clinicians should be paying attention to when assessing an autistic person. So this is a freely available, um, public, publicly available resource um, that our committee put together. I have Lisa's website listed here um, and you can access this resource there. Uh, for the sake of time today, I'm not gonna go through it in detail. I'll just share a few of the, the main take, take home points from that, that resource. The first thing to keep in mind when assessing for warning signs of suicide in autistic individuals is to remember that the thinking process of autistic people is often very literal. And so again, I know this makes it sound a lot simpler than it really is, but as clinicians, we have to consider the exact meaning of what we say. So I think sometimes, you know, clinicians may, may try to um, ask about suicidal thoughts and behaviors in perhaps not the most direct way because they're worried that that direct language could be upsetting. Um, but what we know is that it's very important to speak concretely and to ask exactly about what you're trying to find out. And when you're uh, listening to the responses, you also have to listen with a, with a literal ear, knowing that autistic people will frequently answer what they're asked in a literal way. Um, so I can give a, an example of this uh, that, that Lisa and I talked about. So if you're the clinician and you ask an autistic individual, do you wanna hurt yourself? Right, I think that's a pretty standard screening question. Do you want to hurt yourself? The answer may be no, because they don't want to. But if you ask them, are you planning to hurt yourself? The answer could be yes. So even just the difference of a couple of words, they may feel like they don't have any other choice and they do have a plan to attempt suicide, although they, they don't want to. So they answered no to that first question. They do have the plan. So it's very useful to ask these questions in a few different ways and make sure that we're stating things in very concrete um, and clear and clear terms. So the resource has some more information about this. Um, building off of this resource, we also wanted to put out a guide that includes some more specific warning signs of suicide for autistic people. Um, and so this is a second resource that's available. You can find it at the same website. And what I really like about this, uh, this resource is we were able to collaborate with an international group of um, autism and suicide prevention experts um, highlighted up here. So uh, Lisa brought us all together for about a year and we worked on developing this resource um, based on the existing research findings, which as a disclaimer, there are not a ton of research findings out there, as I mentioned before, um, and clinical consensus. Um, and the other great thing about this team is we really did bring a wide range of experiences, um, and roles, including autistic individuals, researchers, uh, practitioners, and those with lived experience of suicide loss and suicidality. So this newer warning signs resource is designed to enhance discussions about suicide risk with autistic people, but it's not meant to be a substitute for professional support or a standard risk assessment. The goal and, and all of the uh, collaborators on this really agree that this was our main goal to improve understanding about uh, what are really signs of imminent suicidal behavior in autistic individuals. Um, and when I first went into this collaboration, I think, you know, I kind of had one, uh, one piece of this in mind of, of why misunderstanding uh, signs of imminent suicidal behavior can have such devastating consequences. Um, and it may be what you all are thinking as well, that as a clinician, we do not want to miss a sign, right? We don't want to overlook a sign of imminent suicidal behavior, um, because that, of course, could, could lead to the loss, loss of that person's life. Um, through talking with Lisa and other people um, contributing to this resource, I also started to think about kind of the other side of that. If we assume something is a warning sign of suicide when it's actually not, that can also lead to very negative consequences for the autistic individual. Um, and, and, and there are plenty of examples of this, right? Where the autistic person um, may say something or may be presenting in a certain way and the clinician interprets that as a warning sign, and then things escalate very quickly, and maybe that person's sent to the emergency department or 911 is called, 
And in fact, they were not at imminent risk of suicide. Again, there was just that misunderstanding. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. So I definitely encourage you to, to check out this, this resource and I can put um, links in the, in the chat when I'm done presenting. But to give you a sense of the structure, um, it includes the 10 warning signs. Um, we have scenarios or case examples for each one, a paragraph on the emerging research findings. And then for people who want to learn more, um, some additional resources at the end and a one page summary for clinicians to use in real time. All right, so here are the 10 warning signs of suicide for autistic individuals in this resource. I'm not gonna go through all of them um, in, in detail, but I will um, give you a moment to look through them. And then I'm gonna share a couple of case, um, case examples to, to highlight them. Okay. So the first one I would like to describe a little bit more is the first one, sudden or increased withdrawal. So I'm just gonna read this scenario. And then since we're all on Zoom, if people wanna use the chat um, and just share what would be concerning uh, to you if, if you were working with Lucia. So this is Lucia who routinely withdraws for self-care. Her family and friends understand the need she has for alone time. They know Lucia will be spending time in her room for a while after school, work, and social events, and then she'll immerse herself in making clay animals. Suddenly, Lucia's family and friends notice she was spending more and more time in her room. She goes straight to her room when she gets home, only coming out for meals. She continues to participate in her usual activities, although she doesn't want to and she takes longer to regulate afterwards. Lucia is no longer interested in making her clay animals, and she has not replaced that passion with another. So if you were um, a clinician working with Lucia, what would potentially be a red flag for you here? Great, thank you for people putting things in the chat. I see the yes, increased, increased isolation, several marked changes from, from baseline, um, no longer participating in special interests, that anhedonia, absolutely. These are all things that um, would definitely be red flags, things that we would want to get some more, um, some more information about. Um, anything else about that special interest, the fact that she's no longer interested in um, making clay animals, anything else that sticks out to people as concerning? Exactly, and then yes, she's not replaced it with anything else. So we know that, that um, yes, and Gary, that's exactly right. It's not replaced by another interest. Um, anyone who, who works with autistic individuals knows that um, they may not have that same passionate interest for their whole lives, right? It, it is very common for people to, to switch, to adapt, um, but the fact that she's not replaced that with something else is concerning. Um, and exactly, that was that was something that helped her cope, and now she's she's lost that. Um, thank thank you everybody for putting your thoughts in the chat. The one other thing I'll highlight here, and this is something I I've learned from Lisa and other autistic partners of mine, the fact that she's continuing to participate in her usual activities. This is an area where autistic individuals may present differently than non-autistic people, right? So we know, for example, if we're assessing for depression. Um, People may really withdraw and stop doing their new, their usual activities, um, but for autistic individuals who really um, either enjoy structure, enjoy routine, or find that routine and structure to be comforting, even when they are having a really difficult time and they may not want to continue participating in their usual activities, it's their routine, right? So they're still doing it. So if we're looking for that uh, that change in routine. You may not see it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't having a really, really difficult time. Um, so, you know, still going to schedule meetings, they're, they're scheduled, they're on the calendar, so they're going to do it. But as it says here, it may take them much longer to regu regulate afterwards. All right. Okay. Let's move on to one other scenario. So this is a warning sign that there really is not much research out there about this, but we are learning more and more from autistic individuals about their own experiences with this. Um, no words to communicate acute distress. 
Um, so this is about Taylor, who's an autistic woman diagnosed later in life. She's developed PTSD due to experiencing numerous traumatic experiences in her life. When triggered, she finds she has lost the ability to communicate. The words she wants to say are swirling around so fast in her thoughts, she can't access them. When Taylor needs help the most, she can't reach out for help. She wants to connect, but it's not possible in that moment. She's not withdrawing, although it can look that way to other people. She appears calm. Words are important to Taylor in navigating through life, and when she loses them, it frightens her. Losing the ability to communicate is defeating, scary, confusing, and gives her a feeling of helplessness, which triggers her and causes her to feel even more isolated and alone. So I'm curious if people have any thoughts about this one for what we as clinicians could do to support Taylor. What, what could we do to help someone who is experiencing uh, no words to communicate when they're in acute distress? As you all are thinking and, and putting some ideas in the chat, I'll say that this is an easy one to miss, right? Because it goes back to this idea that autistic distress may not always look like neurotypical distress. And the person may not be, you know, crying or appearing agitated. They may just go really quiet. Um, so I've, I've seen this happen now um, over Zoom, which is particularly difficult to, to know is someone just kind of distracted doing something else they're they're not talking anymore um or they actually experiencing a crisis um so thank you all for putting some ideas in the chat here um so having different ways of communicating like visuals absolutely um using symbols um making a plan in advance for how others can recognize this and what they can do that is that's key um and one thing I will say, I think as, as a clinician is it can be really validating for aut your autistic clients to even know that other people have experienced this, if this is something that they've experienced, right? So if you talk with them in advance and say, you know, has this happened to you? And if so, how can we make a plan so that you can uh, communicate that this is happening? What can I do to support you if this is happening? Things like that. Um, so using art therapy, um, having, you know, maybe a practice script, grounding techniques. Um, absolutely. So having these alternative ways of communication. Um, I have heard from some autistic individuals that if they have someone, this may not be the clinician, but if they have someone they can text and they have an agreed upon emoji, just one emoji that they text, not words, and it communicates that they are experiencing this and they are at a very high level of distress, that that can be a helpful way of um of making sure that someone knows that this is happening. I, all of these thoughts are, are really, really great. I'm not gonna read them all aloud, but you all are definitely thinking about some effective strategies, which is great. All right, so this is another one to keep in mind. Um, again, there's very little research in this area. Um, Sarah Cassidy and her colleagues um, in the UK have found that autistic adults who have attempted suicide are significantly more likely to report not telling anyone uh, because of not knowing how to communicate this to others. So that's not exactly the same thing, um, but it does again highlight that we may not always know what is um, going on internally and there may be some communication or social communication difficulties that are really getting in the way. All right. So we've talked now about risk factors and warning signs. I wanna switch gears a little bit. It's really important when talking about suicide risk and autism to talk about crisis supports and, and crisis um, resources. I do wanna make a disclaimer, which I'm sure some of you are probably sick of hearing me say this by now, but there's very little research in, in this area. Um, it, it's very troubling, in my opinion, that we know autistic individuals are at increased risk of suicide, but there's very little research out there examining how can we mitigate suicide risk in autistic people. Um, there are no published studies um, that my team knows of on suicide prevention interventions for autistic individuals. Um, there are no consensus clinical guidelines. Um, and so there's this large evidence gap about how best to intervene to reduce suicide risk in autistic people. 
Um, given the limited research in this area, it's unsurprising that the current health system is incredibly underprepared in many ways to effectively manage the influx of suicidal autistic individuals. Uh, we know that clinicians commonly report feeling ill-equipped to address mental health problems broadly and suicide risk specifically in autistic people uh, due to a lack of training, knowledge, and self-efficacy. And this shouldn't be surprising, right? If we don't have the research out there, what would clinicians be getting trained on? Um, there's just this really large gap. And um, I wanted to show this one quote from one of our clinician stakeholders um, who said that it often feels like we're just flying by the seat of our pants when managing suicide risk in autistic individuals uh, due to a lack of tailored interventions. And I know any clinician listening knows that is an awful, awful feeling, right? When you feel like you're flying by the seat of your pants, you don't know what to do. Um, it's really a terrible feeling, particularly when you're dealing with someone who's expressing suicidal, suicidal thoughts. So I wanna show you a couple of free resources and then talk a little bit about some of our work with the tailored safety planning intervention. Um, so this was Lisa's first resource with the Autism and Suicide Committee. This is actually how I first found out about the Autism and Suicide Committee and Lisa's amazing work. I was interviewing autistic adults in Philadelphia um, where I did my postdoctoral training and I was asking them about mental health broadly and they were talking a lot about suicide risk specifically. And again, as I mentioned, I had not learned anything about this in grad school. So I did what any good researcher would do. I went to Google, <laughs> I typed in autism crisis supports and this resource was one of the first things that, that popped up. Um, so I definitely encourage you all to check this out. It was designed for crisis support or crisis center workers. So people who are um, you know, working at, at Crisis Lifeline, um, but really the recommendations are, um, are relevant to a wider group of, of professionals. And uh, Lisa does a really nice job of, of identifying some practical recommendations for how we can support um, autistic people who are in crisis. Um, in the UK, Autistica has a resource as well about supporting autistic children and young people who are experience, experiencing a mental health crisis. So I wanted to include the link for that um, as well. So I know I've um, mentioned a few different resources, a few different um, toolkits at this point, and I've learned a lot from, from Lisa and some of my other collaborators about how, you know, how important it is to have things like this that are they're free, right? They're not behind a paywall like some of our academic journal papers are. We can get this information out, disseminate it widely. Um, but if we kind of think beyond uh, toolkits, we know that there is still this really big problem that many autistic individuals are not able to access uh, quality mental health services. Um, and so I want to just briefly touch on this because I think there's some real recommendations that I'm sure many of you all are, are already doing, um, but just want to touch on, on this public health, health crisis that autistic individuals are facing when it comes to mental health services. And I'll be pulling um, from this paper um, for, for most of this. So Ongoing challenges for autistic individuals um, needing mental health services include, as I mentioned, there's a lack of mental health interventions um, designed not only for autistic individuals, but designed for community implementation. Um, so many of our evidence-based interventions for autistic individuals, you know, they've been tested in these very well-resourced academic medical settings, and they've not shown, they've not been shown to um, be able to, to be implemented and sustained in community-based settings. We know that there is a limited workforce capacity trained to work with autistic individuals. We know that the service systems are really complex and um, disconnected. So for example, the mental health service system and the developmental disabilities service system. And then of course, there are racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities um, across all of this in the accessibility and in the quality of, of mental health services. So thinking about um, a path forward, 
We definitely need more evidence-based treatments adapted or tailored for autistic individuals. And I'm gonna be going into that one in some more depth in just a moment. We need strategies that are feasible to translate to community settings and sustainable in those settings. We need more training and ongoing supports for community clinicians. So people who, who don't have all the resources as an academic medical center, um, but who are seeing a lot of autistic individuals, even, even if they don't know it. So I think some mental health clinicians in the community, they're working, they're working with people who are on the spectrum but haven't received a diagnosis yet. Um, and we need to have a lot more training about autism for them, both at the pre-service level, so in graduate programs, right, through things like coursework and practicum placements, and then in continuing education as well. Increasing that coordination um, between systems, which I know um, some of you all are really doing great work to do this um, with models like Project ECHO, uh, making sure that autistic individuals with co-occurring psychiatric conditions aren't stuck between these silos of care. And then um, taking this equity-focused approach to autism research and care is also a really important consideration. And then last, but certainly not least, um, I, I actually think this, this may be uh, one of the most important of all, we have to listen to the voices of our autistic partners. So autistic individuals have been, I think, telling the field for years and years and years about how important um, mental health is, how mental health and suicide prevention, these are really top priorities for, all the, for the autistic community. Um, and they've been telling us to, to take action. So keeping all of that in mind, um, how can we do some of these things, both on a, a small scale and on a larger scale? Um, I want to highlight some of the work that my amazing colleague and friend, um, Dr. Sherry yeager Hyman from the University of Pennsylvania, and I have been doing to adapt the safety planning intervention for autistic people. Um, so as I mentioned, I used to be in, in Philadelphia, um, Sherry and I worked on the same hall at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she's at the Penn Center for Suicide Prevention, um, directed by Dr. Greg Brown. Um, and I was at the Penn Center for Mental Health, as Karen mentioned, um, directed by David Mandel. And Sherry brings this rich suicide prevention expertise, um, but she did not know much about autism. And so when we first paired up, I kind of you know brought this autism expertise and um, didn't know that much about suicide prevention trials. And so we were able to um, get a pilot uh, grant from the FAR Fund, the private foundation, really focused on how can we bring our expertise together and adapt the safety planning intervention for um, autistic individuals. And I'm guessing that Probably everyone here, if if uh, if not everyone, then most people are very familiar with the safety planning intervention. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time talking about what this is, um, but just as a very brief background, the safety planning intervention or SPI, it's a brief evidence-based clinical intervention for reducing the short-term risk of suicide. And we often refer to this um, as the Stanley Brown safety plan. Um, I actually think it's helpful to clearly state what we what we mean when we talk about a safety plan, because I know the term safety plan can be used in other ways as well, right? Um, but we're talking about the Stanley Brown safety planning intervention, um, Dr. Barbara Stanley pictured here, um, and, and Dr. Greg Brown, um, who, as I mentioned, um, directs the center where Sherry works. And one thing that Sherry and I really, um, like about the safety plan and one of the reasons we wanted to kind of pick this as an intervention to be adapted is that the Stanley Brown safety plan is meant to be individually tailored to meet the needs of each patient. It can be used to prevent or de-escalate a crisis and there is a lot of evidence um, about its ability to do this, although I will say this evidence has not been with autistic individuals. Um, but for all of uh, the research that has been done um, with the general population, it is recommended by the Joint Commission and uh, recommended widely by suicide prevention organizations um, to be used in, um, in clinical practice. So this probably looks familiar to you all. This is the original, the, the Stanley Brown safety plan. Um, so you can see it looks like 
a like a list. It, it looks like a worksheet, right? But we know that it's not. It's not if if done correctly. This is not just a worksheet or a form. It really is a collaborative intervention. Um, so this should be filled out in collaboration with the individual and um, and the clinician. And as I mentioned, there were there's some things about this Stanley Brown Safety Plan that stuck out both to Sherry and and to myself with um, making us think that it could be a good fit for autistic people who are at, at risk of suicide. So some of the reasons we thought it could be a good fit include it's written. We know autistic individuals often do well with those kind of visual support. So you get it there on the page. Um, it's concrete in, in some ways. And um, as I highlighted earlier, the fact that it can be tailored to, to fit individual needs, preferences, and interests. This was a big benefit um, in our in our opinion. Um, it can also really build on the strengths of autistic people. Um, and I'm curious if, if anyone has any thoughts on this one, feel free to use the use the chat again. Um, if you can think of what are some strengths of autistic people that could really be leveraged when either filling out the safety plan or when they're implementing the safety plan at home or or in the in the community. Can anyone think of any strengths of autistic individuals that could be leveraged for safety planning? Great, from Joe, routines, exactly, that's a big one. Um, if we can make the safety plan an established routine, um, then we know that autistic people are gonna be likely to, to follow it, to use it, which is great. Um, their ability to think concretely could lead to a good generate generation oh, generation um, of lists of strategies. Absolutely. So we want the safety plan to be detailed. We want to have a lot of concrete details on there for coping strategies. So that's a great strength to leverage. Um, honesty. That's a big one that we talk a lot about. Um, absolutely. If you ask the right questions, you're likely going to get honest answers, and that's going to help with with the safety plan. Um, I also, yes, agree about great at following rules. So if we can set this up as if you're noticing these warning signs of a suicidal crisis, then you use your safety plan and establish that as the rule, um, that can be very effective, effective as well. So what I really like about some of these strengths that people are putting in um, is sometimes these things are not considered strengths, right? We talk about being, you know, maybe they're, they're rule-based or they're, um, they get stuck on routines, things like that. But these are great examples of how we can actually leverage some of those characteristics um, to increase the effectiveness of the, of the safety plan. Um, and yeah, not limited by the expectations um, of adults. And so I think that might feed in as well to having some really creative answers when you're, when you're brainstorming what can go on the safety plan. So those are all really great strengths to keep in mind. The last point here is that um, the Stanley Brown Safety Plan can help people manage suicide risk from home, which is a way to avoid the need for emergency department visits or inpatient stays, um, which we know can be unhelpful or even harmful for autistic people. So in other words, if the individual can better manage their risk from home, then they don't need to go to the hospital. And this relates, I think, to that quote from one of our clinician stakeholders about you know, flying by the seat of, of their pants um, we heard from clinicians, if we had a, a safety plan that we felt like could be a good fit for autistic people, we could do the safety plan and not send them straight to the emergency department. And I know that uh, what's happening at a lot of places, unfortunately, is because they don't feel confident about what to do, they're very quick to send an autistic individual to the emergency department, um, even if the, the extent of that suicide risk is not very high. All right, so these are some of the, the things that we really like about the Stanley Brown Safety Plan for autistic people. Um, but there were some other things that made us not wanna just move forward with the original form. So in terms of potential challenges, um, when Dr. Stanley and Dr. Brown were first developing the, state, the safety plan, um, they did not have autistic people in mind, unsurprisingly, right? That was not their, their goal at the time. And so um, I would argue that the original safety plan is really built on a lot of neurotypical biases. There are a lot of kind of neurotypical assumptions built into it. Um, it's very reliant on social communication and interactions. Multiple steps um, are asking about people, um, people who could be distracting, people who could be comforting, people you could call. Um, 
I don't know if you all had this reaction, but it's a pretty busy layout. And we know from autistic individuals that having all those words swimming on the page, um, that can be overwhelming even in the best of times, let alone when you're um, in a crisis. And then uh, you may have noted the original form has a bunch of lines, uh, numbered lines, right? So it's really pulling for written responses. And we know that for some autistic people, um, they may prefer to draw, um, right? Or have other modes of communication as some people were, were putting in the chat earlier. So Sherry and I wanted to learn directly from um, stakeholder uh, partners about what they like about the Stanley Brown Safety Plan and what they would wanna see changed. Um, so you can see up here, the different groups we interviewed. Um, we intentionally wanted to talk with autistic individuals with experience with suicidal ideation. So having that lived experience. We also wanted to talk with clinicians, both from autism specific settings where they have that autism expertise, but may not as routinely um, screen or assess for suicide risk. And then clinicians from general behavioral health settings um, who are much more um, experienced um, in our sample with suicide risk assessment and management. Once we got this feedback, we made adaptations um, to the Stanley Brown Safety Plan with permission from uh, Dr. Stanley and Brown. And then we kept going back to um, a smaller group of our autistic partners to get feedback. We did not get it right the first time. We did not get it right the second time. We did not get it right the third time. Um, and on and on and continue to incorporate that feedback to improve the safety plan. So we did hear some advantages from people we interviewed about the Stanley Brown safety plan. People like that it's proactive, it can increase individual safety, that having it can normalize feelings and thoughts around suicide. Um, people like that it can be used to educate the autistic individual and their family if applicable. People really like that it is structured, that it's on a pa pa one page, it's all there. Um, people said the structure can be helpful, you know, for the client or the individual and also for the clinician, which I appreciate having some guidance. And then again, this theme that I've brought up now a few times, the fact that it can be individually tailored was a big advantage. I want to share some examples of the main modifications that our team made to the safety plan based on, you know, feedback from those interviews and the iterative, iterative feedback from our autistic partners. So this is not all the modifications for the sake of time, but some to give you a flavor. Reduce the number of words. This is probably the one where we kept coming back and kept uh, getting very helpful feedback. Sherry and I would think we've cut as many words as we can. It's not going to get any any more concise than this. And then our autistic partners would very um, brilliantly point out, you don't really need those three words there. Or, or, you know, here you could cut this down and pull it into a clinician guide that's clinician facing, but the patient does not need to see all those words. So that was extremely, extremely helpful. A lot more white space now. For the uh, words we left on, we have made the language much more direct. And here's a quote from one of our interview, autistic interview participants to highlight why it's very important to make language direct and concrete. So this was, um, this person was talking about a safety plan they had where under the warning signs, that top box, very important box, right, to show uh, when are you supposed to use your safety plan? And the warning sign that clinician had written down was when you're feeling blue. Um, and that was not, not help, helpful for this individual. We reduced the focus on social interactions. And as this participant said, I know a lot of people, but I wouldn't put their name down there. They're not someone I would want to talk to in this situation. So we really learned from our autistic interview participants and our autistic partners um, that it does not necessarily have to be another human being, right, who's providing distraction or who's providing even support or comfort. It could be a pet, right? It could be an animal, it could be an object, it could be a lot of things, and really trying to remove this um, assumption that it's always going to be a person. We added reasons for living, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with reasons for living. This is an evidence-based brief suicide prevention strategy, but it actually was not on the original Stanley Brown safety planning form. I know some people do add that in when they're safety planning, which I think is great, um, but we wanted to make sure that it's really front and center on the tailored safety plan because we heard from many autistic individuals that 
reflecting on their reasons for living is the thing that kept them alive when they were experiencing a suicidal crisis. So again, we wanted to make this front and center. We added meaningful color um, based on feedback from our autistic partners. And then the last one I'll highlight is that we deleted the default emergency services. So if you remember in the original form under professionals or agencies I can contact during a crisis, there is pre-populated the suicide prevention line. Any guesses from this group? Feel free to use the chat about why we would delete, why we would delete that number. We still have a section for crisis support services. We've just deleted that pre-populated number. Um, so Mendy, I think got it here. It might not be helpful to this population if they don't have experience. So the crisis lifeline, um, crisis support centers do not have any sort of autism or even neurodiversity training um, built into their standard training. And so we are learning more and more um, we actually just finished a, a big survey of this about the negative experiences that autistic people are having when either calling or texting, unfortunately. So it's not only just the, the verbal um, interaction, the, the crisis lifeline. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement about 988 um, rolling out, um, but even with 988, it, they're still getting connected to um, crisis center workers who do not have this training to potentially um, know how to tailor their strategies for autistic people. So I think a lot of people in the chat are saying something similar, but um, we are hearing more and more that this experience has, has not only been unhelpful, but actually harmful for autistic people. So we don't want that to be pre-populated as we heard from several of our autistic partners, I'm never gonna call that number again. So how would it feel if your clinician then hands you this paper that already has that number pre-populated on it. If people want to include 988 or other um, crisis lines, that is absolutely fine. We just want to give people the option. We want to leave it white space open so that people can fill in what they actually think they would call or contact in a crisis to make it as individually tailored as possible. Okay, so um, Sherry and I were working on this um, for months and months. Um, when I was in Philadelphia, as I mentioned, um, COVID hit, we went virtual, we kept working on it. Um, and then in the, in the summer of 2022, I took my family and both my kids were born in Philly. They were true city, city kids, um, city babies from Philly. And we moved to where I am now here in North Carolina at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and so now they have quickly transitioned. Now they're pure country kids um, through and through. We do miss Philadelphia a lot, but they have really been enjoying all the all the nice green space and um, and country out out here in North Carolina. And I'll tell you all that right. You know, when we moved in that summer, uh, Sherry and I were definitely not planning on submitting any uh, large scale grants uh, focused on this tailored safety planning approach. We were still kind of getting our feet under us. Um, however, right after I moved, PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, released this funding announcement focused on um, brief suicide prevention interventions for, um, for suicide prevention. And, you know, we were interested in this. We, we wanted to take a look. And what was very exciting is that this funding announcement specifically talked about being interested in what they called culturally adapted approaches for underserved subpopulations. So this is straight from the funding announcement. And right there at the end, they said individuals with disabilities. Um, and what they were interested in were teams studying these adapted approaches to brief interventions, such as the safety planning intervention. So Sherry and I felt like this is too good to be true. <laughs> this is exactly what we've done. It's still, it still has all the core components of the Stanley Brown safety plan. So it's not a, <clears throat> brand, new, a brand new intervention by any means, um, but we've got to, got to give this a, give this a try. And so now we're um, 
very happy to be able to do this PCORI funded um, study, which I'll just share a little bit more about in these last few minutes and then open it up, open it up for questions. Um, so we started this trial in January of 2022. And the long term objective is to reduce the number of autistic lives lost to suicide by providing key stakeholders uh, with the most effective suicide prevention practices. Uh, for autistic youth. And autistic youth, uh, youth is the um, word that PCORI used in the funding uh, um, opportunity. They define the age range, actually. So all the teams funded, there are four teams funded under this announcement, um, and the age range is set to um, ages 15 to 24. So um, I would probably refer to that age group as adolescents and young adults. Um, and uh, PCORI refers to them as youth, so you'll see us use that, that term throughout here. Um, so very briefly, what we're aiming to do in this study, um, it is a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial uh, where we're primarily interested in the effectiveness outcomes of that tailored safety planning approach. Um, the comparison that we're doing here, because PCORI funds comparative effectiveness studies, is the tailored safety planning approach with and without a structured follow-up component. And I'm happy to talk more about that if, if people are interested. Um, but we are recruiting 1,500 autistic youth um, to participate in, in this study, and we'll be able to actually look at differences in um, suicidal thoughts and behavior um, between these two groups. And for the implementation aim, we're looking at um, outcomes such as acceptability and feasibility um, using mixed methods. And then we're really interested in um, the, the moderation analyses. These will be exploratory, but looking at um, you know, the heterogeneity that's associated with autism, can we figure out uh, not only which strategy works best, but for whom and, and under what conditions. So we're really lucky to get to partner with four different health systems for this study, um, pictured there at the bottom. And what's exciting is that um, almost all of these um, settings already had a, an approach in place for screening and assessing for suicide risk in autistic individuals. Um, Nationwide and Kennedy Krieger, for example, are collaborating with Drs. Audrey Thurm and Lisa Horowitz at the NIMH um, to test the um, Ask Suicide um, screening questionnaire, the ASK. So they had that screening and assessment piece down really well. And where they were feeling much less confident was the safety plan. And so they agreed to adopt this tailored safety planning approach as part of standard care. Um, because again, it's not a brand new intervention. Most clinicians doing the safety plan were already making some modifications anyway. Our hope is that this is gonna um, be able to provide them a systematic adaptation across clinics. And then for the clinicians who agree to be part of the research study, they're randomly assigned um, to either implement that structured follow-up or not. And then perhaps my favorite part of all about this study is that it's an example of community-based participatory research. So what do I mean by that? Um, there is an amazing group, some of you are familiar with this group, named the Autistic Adults and Other Stakeholders Engaged Together, or ASSET group. And it's co-led by Dr. Stephen Shore, pictured here, and Dr. Teal Benavides. Um, Stephen and Teal got funding from PCORI to um, form assets. So this was a stakeholder engagement award from PCORI back in 2017. And they brought together a group of autistic adults and other stakeholders with this goal of, of figuring out how we can meaningfully include autistic partners in patient-centered outcomes research. And although their funding ended, I think in 2019, ASSET has continued to publish together, present together, and Stephen and Teal actually reached out to me uh, when this funding opportunity came out to see if I would want to partner with ASSET to submit a proposal, um, which was a huge, a huge honor. I always say that'll probably go down as one of the biggest honors of my whole career. Um, and I know that PCORI, I do think that that is probably a big reason why we got funding is PCORI loves to see um, this kind of authentic engagement of stakeholders from the very beginning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so ASSET is doing really incredible work. And um, what I'm gonna show you now is, vis is visually overwhelming. So I will give you that disclaimer. Um, I just wanna show you all what um, an amazing team we get to work with. 
Um, you can see here how um, Teal and Steven are co-leading our stakeholder engagement core. I'm not gonna go through all of this here, but I do wanna highlight, highlight a few things. Um, I wanna highlight our Asset Community Council, um, which is comprised of autistic adults, um, and this is the group that's really been with our, our team from the very beginning. So starting at the letter of intent stage, when we had to write a three-page letter of intent to PCORI, we met with the Asset Community Council to identify the priority outcomes for the study. Um, we created opportunities for authentic autistic involvement in our study team roles. So as an example of that, we have um, interviewers who are responsible for um, the qualitative interviews for our implementation outcome assessment. And Sherry and I had put in the plan that we would use our research coordinators. Um, I, I would be overseeing the research coordinators to do these interviews. And when we were doing these planning meetings with ASSET, we had several ASSET members say, so wait, these are gonna be interviews with autistic participants in the study? And Sherry and I said, yeah, with some of the autistic participants, not all 1,500, but a subset will be doing a, a qualitative interview. And Asset said, well, then shouldn't one of the interviewers be autistic? And we said, that's a really good idea that we had not thought of. Thank you. So now um, the implementation interviews are co-led um, by an autistic member um, from Asset. So that's just one example of a study team role. Asset also helped us finalize a governance and engagement plan, which includes um, a shared decision-making process, which I'm happy to talk more about if people are interested in that. Um, re they revised our um, all of our patient-facing forms. Um, we also have uh, an outcome measure that really was not a good fit for the autistic community, um, and they helped us significantly revise that. And then they've been contributing to dissemination ideas from, from the beginning. So really wanted to highlight some of the amazing work that Community Council has been doing. Lastly, I wanna highlight our clinician training team, um, co-led by Lisa Morgan. You heard a lot about Lisa earlier. Um, so this was our real focus, a big focus of year one of the study was training the clinicians. We couldn't recruit patients until we trained all these clinicians across the four health systems um, in the tailored safety planning approach. Um, so for about a two month period, um, this past uh, summer slash fall, we conducted these training sessions. Um, our autistic partners felt very strongly that they needed to have um, a live component. So over Zoom, a three hour uh, Zoom session. Um, we did 20 of these as a very busy time. Um, Sherry, Lisa and I were uh, co-leading all 20 of these. We're really happy that we were able to reach over 300 um, individuals. Not all of these individuals were um, in a role where they would be independently implementing the safety plan, um, but they may have just been interested in, in wanting to learn more about it. And then of the people who are eligible for the study, we've got 158 uh, clinicians at this point um, who are helping us recruit patient participants now. Um, so the clinician training team has really done, I think, already a lot of great work in terms of uh, making, making an impact. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback about this training um, and we're really trying to figure out what's the best way to, to make this more, more accessible. Um, even though the study is still ongoing, are there pieces that we can go ahead and, and share? So really interested if people have thoughts about that as well. Um, and then in my last minute here before questions, I'll just end um, on some, some conclusions some some take-homes I, I hope that you all will take from this presentation today. Most importantly, we all have a role to play in suicide prevention efforts for autistic people. And I think a big part of that role to be effective is to take the time and, and make the space to learn directly from autistic people who have lived experience of, of suicidality. I could talk for hours and hours about all of the kind of eye-opening moments I've had um, learning uh, learning from my autistic partners because they're, they're the ones who really know what it's like to be on the spectrum and um, have these oftentimes, you know, very, very persistent um, suicidal thoughts and, and urges. Um, I think, Probably people here don't 
buy into this misconception, but I know there is that misconception out there that, oh, we shouldn't ask about suicidal thoughts. It might put the idea in someone's head. Um, I would strongly encourage everyone to make sure you're asking concretely, concisely, and then really listen to the answer with a literal ear. Um, we kind of just touched on this briefly. Again, this could be a whole, a whole other discussion and talk, but it's a really, really big problem that our crisis centers and other um, mental health professionals don't have more autism specific training. So um, Lisa and I and the Autism and Suicide Committee, we're trying to advocate for this to be part of the mandatory training. Um, 988, we're trying to really push on that as well. Um, and we need more advocacy efforts there. And then I talked mostly today about, you know, an individual, a clinical intervention, the safety planning intervention. We also need to think about, you know, going back to the beginning of the talk, some of those risk factors. What can we more on a society or a systems level do to really reduce stigma and reduce autistic burnout so that we can overall reduce suicide risk in the autistic population? Because I've learned so much from, from Lisa, I do want to end with a quotation from Lisa. She wrote this in, a, in an article um, published in Spectrum Women. Um, she wrote that suicide is like a killer in our midst that no one wants to talk about instead of meeting it head on. And, you know, this was back in 2019 when she wrote this. Um, I think we are talking about this more now in the autism field. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this topic today with you all. Um, and we need to do more than, than just talk, right? So, if you have any ideas that you'd like to share about how we can move things forward um, more efficiently and, and more effectively in this regard, um, please feel free to, to reach out, to email me. My email is, is listed here at the bottom. And I just wanted to end by sharing my extreme gratitude for all of our community partners, academic collaborators, research participants, um, the funding sources, um, because I talked a lot about the Pecori study, I'm going to also put up this required statement as well from, um, from Pecori. And thank you all so much for your attention um, this morning. I know it's early there, and I'm happy to answer any questions in our last little bit of time. Well, thank you so much, Brenna. This is such a rich set of information and a lot to think about. And I do think that there's a, there's a lot of thanks coming through in the chat, for one thing. Um, but I also think... Um, there's a lot of overlap in, in what you're doing and what I think at least we are at the beginning stages of thinking about doing here. Um, so I, I'm hoping that we'll get some discussion going about that. Um, one of the um, comments in the chat was about the Trevor Project, though. This is specifically yeah. about kind of places to call. And I wonder if you have yes. any, um, any thoughts about that as a, as a resource. Thank, thank you for highlighting that, Carol. I, I just saw that, too. I was hoping you would highlight that. Um, yeah, so I will say this is only kind of anecdotal data, but from our asset community council, the people I talk most frequently and, and deeply with about this topic, we have heard um, positive reviews of the Trevor project um, from them and from, from their um, connections, saying that the people they, they talk to there just seem to kind of get it more. Um, and and did give them a better experience um, calling or texting that the their helpline. Um, so that is something in our clinician training that we mention. We also know that autistic individuals, you know, that intersection with the LGBTQ community. You're probably seeing that a lot in your practice. So I think the Trevor Project is is a good um, resource to to keep in mind. Great. And then a, a question came in. I'm going to read it because I think there are some people who are on you know, won't be seeing the screen, but, or being able to access the chat. Can you speak a little bit to how suicidal ideation and self-harm risk behaviors might present in younger children? I'm presuming this is younger children with autism. Mm -hmm. And are there helpful ways to differentiate baseline self-harm behavior from self-harm with suicidal intent, intent in this population? Yeah, the, those are really, really great questions. Um, so of course it, it can be it can be difficult, particularly if you're working with kids who do not have the verbal abilities to you know report on um, on what's what's going on. Or maybe they have the verbal skills, but they may have a harder time describing their their emotions. And so um, first of all, I just want to say I think this can be really tricky. Um, some 
thoughts or recommendations that I have. One, it's really to partner closely with the parent or caregiver, or if they're in school, you know, learning from the teachers as well, and asking about any change from baseline. Um, even if it's not, if it ends up not being suicidal ideation related, any kind of change of change in baseline, I think is important to figure out kind of what's what's going on. Um, so looking at those warning signs that we talked about, you know, that that withdrawal could happen in a younger kid, right? They may not want to be playing with their favorite toy anymore, or um, maybe they, you know, have have a friend from school that they're not playing with as much anymore at school or, or something like that as well. Um, I think that, you know, oftentimes parents will be able to, to say that they've seen this change in baseline. They're not exactly sure why. And that's where I think we can bring in some of our clinical expertise about, about warning signs and, and bring it up. Um, in terms of the self, oh, the self-harm, yes, baseline self-harm behaviors versus self-harm with, with suicidal intent. This is where, um, depending on kind of the developmental level of your, of your patient or client, I think it's so important to just ask concretely, really, really ask in the, um, it's called the ASK, which is confusing, the ASQ, um, the, the ASK suicide screening questionnaire. Um, I really like how those screening questions are, they're written directly. Um, you know, they're not really um, wasting any time. Um, I don't know what screening measure you all are using there in your clinics, but I think most standard screener, screeners are going to ask about suicidal thoughts in a in a pretty direct way. And that can be really helpful to distinguish between, you know, baseline self-harm, which we know is also elevated in autistic people versus self-harm with that suicidal intent. Yeah, we, you know, I, I feel like I'm not the best person to speak about this. I see Molly, Adrian and Karen Bears both on, on this call, but I'll, I'll maybe start the, the conversation and they can jump in that the whole hospital has started using the ASQ as a screener mm -hmm. for all kids who go through like the ED and other, other clinics outside of psychiatry. And so, Great. Um, yeah, and that Molly or Karen, do you want to comment on the zero suicide and how you see it kind of intersecting with this talk? Uh, well, I can start and say, I, I was literally writing Brenda emails in the middle of her talk about, you know, our, our screening process and, and uh, yeah, that every, every kid tenant up, uh, that presents in, in person, at least, uh, is given the ASQ. And I, I, but the question I was asking you, because you were talking uh, earlier about language, <clears throat> and that language matters. <clears throat> and so I had the question, I was wondering about whether the ASQ uh, was, was hitting the mark there. So it's encouraging to hear that you're, um, you're, you're feeling positive about that, that measure, because that is what we're using as our kind of kickoff screen that then moves, uh, if a kid uh, answers yes on any of the items, moves on to a more comprehensive screen that may move right. to the safety planning piece. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's really great. I mean, I, I'm eager to find out the results of, of this, um, this study I mentioned earlier, led by um, Audrey Thurm and Lisa Horowitz from the NIMH. So they have some additional items to be asked that they are testing um, at Nationwide and Kennedy Krieger. I think COVID really slowed that down. So they're, they're kind of catching up now. Um, but I, yeah, I'll be interested, Karen, to find out, do we need to add some additional items to, to the ask, or is it okay to just, just use those? But for our PCORI funded suicide prevention trial, which Audrey, um, and Lisa Horowitz, um, were part of that, that training team, we just trained on the original ask or ASQ. There's a comment in the chat actually thanking you and and but calling out that a lot of female yeah. that there's less female identification of autism. So it strikes me that yeah. like using a measure like the ASQ in a at a population level, um, mm -hmm. if it, if it is more friendly, you know, in language mm -hmm. to youth with autism. But I wonder if you have thoughts about the female identification or how how gender might play into the. Yeah, I. The first thing I am thinking with that really good comment is going back to that slide about risk factors for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, getting a first time diagnosis of autism late in life, right? Missing autism supports throughout your childhood and adolescence and being female. 
those do often hang together. And I think Joe, your comment is really highlighting that where, you know, women, they are potentially experiencing multiple risk factors for, um, for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And so we absolutely need to have that, have that on our, on our radar. Carol, can I ask a question building on Karen's? Yes, absolutely. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Brenna, so much for this uh, thorough and much needed uh, discussion about suicide prevention and autism populations. It's been really valuable and I think will inform our efforts moving forward. Um, as Karen had noted, we use the ASQ for um, all screening and all um, settings, inpatient emergency and outpatient medical. Um, and one of the areas that's been really tricky is um, we screen to age, ages 10 and up and mm -hmm. their um, providers can um, make a decision about if the um, ASQ is developmentally appropriate for the patient in front of them. And I think this really comes up for our 10, 11 and 12 year olds particularly if um, they're on the autism spectrum. And I'm wondering if you have any guidance for, um, for our teams that have a variety of backgrounds, um, not just behavioral health and certainly not with um, specific autism training about making that decision for this population or if the benefits of screening a 10 year old who may or may not um, have the developmentally developmental abilities to comprehend what we're asking outweigh the risks of um, that sort of screening approach or how to think about that specific um, area of screening. That is such an important question. And I'm actually thinking about um, Karen, one of our other um, co-leaders from the autism SIG, Cy Nadler has looked into this a little bit um, in a different health system and just seeing more broadly how often clinicians are kind of selecting that, oh, it's not developmentally appropriate to screen kind of regardless of age. I think there's this bias for some clinicians, perhaps not people you're talking about, Molly, but, oh, this person has autism. I don't need to ask these questions, right? And it's because there is this lack of awareness that autistic people are at increased risk of suicide. So I think that's kind of the first point is just making sure that people in your health system are aware that if anything, they should err on the side of, of screening, right? Versus not screening if someone is, is on the spectrum because of what we know about risk factors. Um, and that it's definitely not a reason to say, oh, I didn't screen because they're on the spectrum. Um, that, that is, that's not okay. That, that was something that, that Cy found in his work. Um, and I think what I just said probably answers the second part of your question. I would say it's better to err on the side of asking and you can ask the parents if the, if the 10 year old isn't able to ask on their own, you know, ask, ask the parent. I know other health systems are doing that to kind of fill in and see what information you can get, um, from the parent as well. I also have a low threshold for implementing a safety plan because I feel like it's not, it's not invasive. It's not a, it's not a big lift to do. Um, so if there, if there are some concerns about suicide risk that either the child or the parent is reporting, let's just spend a little bit of extra time to do, to do that safe plan. So I know we're over time. Sorry. Yeah, I hope thank really you so much. I mean, it. I feel like we could keep talking for a long time and I'm so glad that you're open to talking to us more yes, and collaborating please, you know, and yeah. that you'll be in Seattle in November. So, um, we'll definitely want to take advantage of that. And thank you so much. We really appreciate your expertise and I'm are so impressed with the projects that you're doing and the, the help that you're giving to this population that really needs it. Thanks again for having me. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day.